before the offer and it's after the offering, I think. It's just, it's the same either way. So, uh, so I want you to, want you to hang with us there. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you had an amazing day. Uh, we've just had a great weekend going out uh, to the family Christmas at the farm Friday night and then to the Lowry's Parade on uh, Saturday. Good stuff, good stuff, good stuff. So uh, just want to remind you that normally we, we do um, uh, an angel tree for uh, children from the school that we, we are partners with uh, Mount Holly Elementary School. And normally we do um, angel tree gifts for those children. Uh, as, as we were talking about last year, um, they did a little bit differently at the school this year, so we didn't get our names. But we are giving a very generous gift card to every custodian and every cafeteria worker there. And that, if, and so those of you who are normally givers to the to the uh, angel tree, if you would like to donate toward that, you can. Uh, you can just uh, drop uh, either in the offering a little bit, just drop something, make sure you put angel tree on there, uh, or you can give it to us back there at the information counter after the service. But that would help. And uh, I, I told you last week, one of the ladies came up when I gave her the gift card. She said, Pastor Scott, she said, you just don't know. She said, my grandkids would not have Christmas if it was not for this. So, uh, and those people, you know, I hate to say it, but those people are overlooked. You know, uh, they're, they're just, they're, they're underappreciated and overlooked in any society. And so our job is to be what Jesus was doing and look for the overlooked and appreciate the underappreciated. So, God bless you. Thank you for that. Well, we're in our fourth week of Advent. We've got four of our candles uh, lighted today. The first one that we, that we did four weeks ago was the, the shortest purple one now. And uh, that's the very first candle. And that's the prophecy candle. That just talks about the hope that we have uh, in, in waiting for Jesus and the prophets and all their prophecy. The second candle is the next tallest purple one there. That's the Bethlehem candle. We talked about Mary and Joseph's journey to Bethlehem. And uh, how important that was and how that was a part of fulfilling prophecy. We'll talk about that today. The third candle over there is the pink candle, and that's the joy candle. And that, that's the shepherd's candle. Uh, remember, the, the angel said, Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. And uh, so that's that. And then today, the fourth candle is called the angel's candle. And it's a purple candle, and it just represents the, the peace on earth and the peace that the angels brought. And uh, they said, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Let's pray. Father God, we worship you today. We love you. We praise you. We thank you that you uh, came to this earth to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. God, you restored us to you. And you reconciled us to you. And you made dead people alive. And we praise you for that, Lord. And God, thank you for this Christmas season. Thank you that we can, through the, through the eyes of, uh, of a manger and a baby, we can see the amazing God that we serve. We worship you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's just be honest. Jesus' birth was not an accident. It was perfectly planned. It was strategically laid out. It was in the fullness of time, okay, his incarnation was not plan B. We got to understand this, guys. God didn't wake up the day that, that Adam and Eve sinned and go, oh, snap, what happened? A phone is ringing. That's what happened. <laughs> is that God calling? <laughs> um, he didn't wake up and say, oh, no, what are we going to do? Listen, guys. Jesus' birth and his death is not plan B. It's plan A. He knew all along that was going to happen. And the great thing is, if, it, if that had been me and you, we would have said, Adam and Eve, oh, you blew it, out of here. Pfft. I'm going to start over again. But he didn't do that. He said, I love you enough to fix what you messed up and to offer you grace and to offer you mercy, to offer you forgiveness that's what he did. That's what he did. The greatest thing I want you to understand is this. He did it all so he could be in a relationship with you. 
Now, so you got to get that in your head. He did it so he could be in a relationship with you. Think about the relationships you have. Think about the, the importance. Some of those relationships are like, I wish I didn't have that relationship. But some of them are like, you know, man, they just, they, you know. Remember the old uh, uh, Tom Cruise line, you complete me or whatever, whatever that was, you know. You know. Well, listen, hey, he had that all wrong. Jesus completes us. You know, Cindy doesn't complete me. Jesus completes me. Cindy is everything. <laughs> what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. Just because you've already gotten your Christmas present. I did. I got me a Christmas present. Yeah, we had our family Christmas yesterday. So it's going to be weird waking up Christmas to drink coffee and watching the Today Show or something. It's, it's going to be strange, you know. But anyway. He wants a relationship with you. And that's the thing. You know, we had the best time at the parade yesterday. We did. And, and we just, a bunch of us pulled into this one guy's yard. And he's just so sweet. He lets us, lets us come there all the time. And, and we just got to start knowing each other and meeting each other and hanging out with each other. And by the, by the end of the parade, of course, now at the parade, if the Lowry's parade, you've never been there, it's nine and a half hours. <laughs> you know, the, the parade is an hour and a half. The tailgating is nine and a half hours. Okay. But you just get to know everybody so much fun, and we just had a great time. And I'm so glad for those relationships that we were able to build yesterday. Those are like brand new relationships. And, and those relationships, I'm, I, and I don't mean this to sound hokey or cheesy, those relationships bring joy to us. They bring joy to us. Now, like I said, I understand there's some relationships where you just say, that ain't, I, you know, but... Jesus came because God wanted an individual relationship with you. And here's the coolest thing. If you were the only person on the earth, he still would have done it. And if you were the only person on earth when he had to die, he still would have strung up on that cross for you. It has to happen that way. So the amazing thing here that we've got to get in our head today over and over and over is that the Holy God wants a personal relationship with you. That's amazing. That's just the thought of that. It's incredible. And, and, and what better news can it be that, the, that the, the angels brought? You know? I mean, I'm thinking Publisher's Clearinghouse giveaway. Ta-da! $5,000 a, a week for life. And then give half of it away to your whoever left. You know? That's pretty good news. You know? But what kind of news is this? God himself wants to be your friend. Crazy. And for, for most, and I'm just going to say for most of us, Christmas is all about, I have heard this said so many times, I cannot wait for January 2nd. You know, everybody, everybody I talk to, God, I can't wait for January the 2nd. I'm about to kill my youngins. I'm so tired. I'm about to kill them people out yonder cutting in front of me in the parking lot. That woman got my, you know, my Nintendo Switch. It was mine, and she jerked it right out from under me. You know? I can't wait. That's what we've turned Christmas into. We've turned it into hustle. We've turned it into to presents, partying, spending, eating. Now, I don't mind the eating part, okay? <laughs> I do that. I'll do that any day. It don't have to be Christmas for me to chow down. I'll just chow down. But we've turned it into all this stuff that if, if we're really honest, guys, it just totally stresses the family out. I know, uh, and I know several, several businesses and several churches who, d who hold their staff Christmas parties in January. Because they say, your Christmas is already messed up enough. We ain't going to throw nothing else in the mix. So we're going to have us a party in January. You know, I kind of like that idea. I and mean, then we could have one in February, March, and all the way through. But, but see, do you see what I'm saying? We've turned Christmas into this thing that nobody even wants to be around anymore. It's nothing but stress. It's nothing but just craziness. And the thing is, remember we said those relationships bring joy to you? 
Those relationships bring joy to you. When we turn Christmas into stress and stuff and commercialism, guys, we miss the very joy that the angel was talking about. We miss the very joy that the angel was talking about. So here's what I want to do right now. Okay, I'm going to do one of them Tony Robbins things. Okay, if you don't know who he is, good. You don't need to. <laughs> I want you to take, this is what I used to do with the band. When we, right before we went into the marching contest. I want you to breathe in through your nose for four counts. Ready? I'm gonna, and then I'm going to tell you what to do and I'm going to count out for you. Then I want you to breathe in for four, out through your mouth for four, and then let your shoulders down. Okay, ready? This is a band director in me. One, two, ready, go. Now we're ready to go on state marching contest. Oh, no, that's not what we're doing. Okay? I'm ready to go. Let's go. I got a bunch of band people here. We're going to do it. But see, that's what we need. Listen, guys, I promise you, and I'm, I'm bad about this. You need to get up every day and do that. You need to do that when you're about to blow your top. You know, if you, if you watch that movie, American Sniper, Chris Kyle, that's one of the things that he did. If you watch the movie, he counts and he slows his heartbeat down and he counts. And it's so exciting because he does exactly what we used to do with the band. Okay, so do that. Hmm? I that in class, my students say, oh God, she's looking for Jesus. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. She's looking for Jesus. But here's the thing. And what I'm about to say might be misunderstood by some people, and maybe some people in this room, but I'm sure people out there. Guys, there is... What better gift could we have at Christmas than to experience Christmas in the presence of God. Now, Cindy and I love, we had all 97 of our children out there and our grandchildren. <laughs> if you saw the pictures, you, if you were with us at the parade, you'll know it. I was trying to throw some of them under the wagons, all that stuff. It's all good. I'm playing. You know, I was crying. I was just, but it was so much fun. But we love... We love Christmas in the presence of our children and our grandchildren. Why do we forget about Christmas in the presence of the King? Now, I love my grandchildren, but not a one of them died for me. In the presence of the King. Christmas in the presence of God. So I, want to, I, I just want to just set that whole mood for you today. Okay? And the verses that we're looking at today are intended by God to bring joy to the world, good news to the world. But here's what we need to understand, and this is the same for us as it was in Jesus' time. This good news that the angels talked about is not that the world is all of a sudden going to be a perfect place. Do you realize at the time Jesus was born, little girl babies were so worthless that they were put in pots and set on the street to die? The world in Jesus' time was not a perfect place. The world in our time is not a perfect place. In fact, to be honest with you, some of you may have become a Christ follower and realized that life got tougher. I've sat in my office with many, many people and sat in, in over the years of ministry. I remember a high school girl. She said, she said, Scott, I'm, you know, now that I've become a Christian, my parents don't even want anything to do with me. And they tried to, they tried to get her to move out of the house. So becoming a Christian is not the cure-all for your relational, you know, deals. You still have to deal with people. And, you're, and, and Jesus himself said, listen, Jesus himself said it. <laughs> if you're going to follow me, you've got to count the cost. You know, some people are going to tell you that when you become a Christ follower, 
say things beautiful. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Uh-uh. Did, did things look so beautiful for Jesus? Did things look so, so, so beautiful for Peter? For Paul? Remember the scripture in Hebrews where it talks about some of the, the, the heroes of the faith? And it goes on to talk about some of them were sawed in half. Just because you become a Christ follower doesn't mean that your life is going to be hunky-dory the rest of your life. Now, what it does mean is that you've got the power of the Holy Spirit living in you and that Jesus is going to be working through you. So it's not so much a, a, an issue of, of the good news is everything's going to be fine. Because it's not going to be fine. Okay? Your eternity is going to be great. Okay, your eternity is going to be great. But you're still going to face issues right now. And uh, so, but let's, let's keep going through there. We got to, we got to, the good news of this thing is that when you come up on stuff, when stuff comes at you in life, you are not alone. You are not alone. There is somebody there who loves you deeply and they want that relationship with you. And the good news is that God himself, the one who created the Milky Way with a, just sneezing stars in the sky, carving the Grand Canyon with a drop of water, that very God wants a personal relationship with you and is there to walk with you through your trials. That's the good news. And that's, that's what we're talking about here today. Uh, let's turn in our Bibles or turn them on and scroll to them. We're going to be looking at Luke 2, 1 through 20 today. And I'm reading out of the uh, Christian Standard Bible. And uh, remember the Bible is divided into two parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Old Testament's to the left, New Testament's to the right. And Luke is the Matthew, Mark, Luke, third book in the New Testament. And this is, this is the one that you hear lioness say all the time at the end of uh, Charlie Brown Christmas. So you're, you're pretty familiar with this, I guess. But let's, let's read this together, okay? You don't have to read it out loud with me, but they'll be on the screen behind me. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. The first registration took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the family line of David. That's King David we're talking about there. To be registered along with Mary, who was engaged to him and, he, and was pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. She gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him tightly in cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them in the inn. Then it goes on in verse 8. In that same region, the shepherds were staying out in the fields, keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim good news to you of great joy that will be to all people. Today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped tightly in cloth, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was a multitude of heavenly hosts with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to people he favors. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they hurried off and they found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. After seeing them, they reported the message they were told about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary was treasuring up all these things in her heart, meditating on them. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had seen and heard, which were just as they had been told. Let's look at this thing just a second. Jesus experienced the lowest birth. Okay? The lowest birth. 
The, the back story on this, and, and Luke fills us in here, is that Caesar Augustus was the emperor of Rome at this time. And he was the emperor of Rome from 31 B.C. to 14 A.D. He was born as uh, Gaius Octavius. And uh, he was called uh, Caesar Octavi Octavius Caesar. His great uncle was Julius Caesar. And during his time, the capital of the Roman Empire was Rome, which is the, the Rome that's the capital of Italy now. And in the, you know, what you have to understand here is that in the New Testament times, Rome had pretty well conquered most of the known world especially all the, all the countries around the Mediterranean Sea were under Roman rule. And this included, I just went through, looked at the map at some of them, uh, Europe, France, England, North Africa, Spain, North Africa, Israel, Syria, the Middle East, uh, most of Europe. Uh, it, was, it was there. I mean, you know, the, pretty much the Roman Empire conquered the whole known world. Augustus was responsible for all this. So, what he had done, he had just finished a, um, a, a, re, a reconfiguring, if you will, of the administrative positions in every country that they, that they were rulers over. Okay? So it was a massive, massive undertaking that he had done. It wasn't just something like where he sent out a letter and said, or an email and said, okay, you know, everybody do this. No, this was massive. It took years to do. Uh, he, he, he had to order a census because everybody had to know now who they were responsible for. Okay? It's kind of like if you think about our political system with redistricting. Okay, well, they did the whole world that way. <laughs> so they had to know, who am, I who am I representing now? So they had to do this whole worldwide census. And that's why the census, that's why the, the political side of the census came about. And the census was started in 4 B.C. Now this may throw you off here, but hang with me. 4 B.C. is actually the year of Jesus' birth. It's not like zero. Okay? It's, it, it, the calendar is off because in 400 um, there was a mistake made by one of the uh, one of the, the Catholicism things that they were doing, and they 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 wrote a wrong date down, uh, not in the Bible, but but in the calendar. They were calendaring stuff, and so that's why that's why Jesus' birth is not like in zero. You know, we think it comes up and in zero and it starts over again. It was actually four B.C. Okay, that was when he was born. And the census was started before that, and the Bible says that the, the census ended while Quirinius was governor of Syria. So he was governor of Syria all the way to 9 AD. So I'm, I'm not giving you a lot of background, but it's important that you understand this. And so according to this, everybody had to go back to where their family lineage was from, okay? And they had to register there. Now, Joseph uh, was a... Uh, you know, Mary's husband to be, and he was a descendant of King David. And that goes all the way back to the prophecies where uh, God had said, you know, David, one of your, one of your offspring is going to rule for eternity. All right, and so it goes all back. So King David had been born in Bethlehem uh, about a thousand years before this. And so all of David's people, anybody that was, that was related to him had to go back to Bethlehem, which was a little small village about six miles outside of Jerusalem. All right. And so Joseph and Mary had to leave Nazareth, and they had to go to Bethlehem. It's about a 90-mile trip. Now, ladies, think about this. 90 miles walking with your water broke. Hmm. Or riding a donkey. I, walking probably better. I ain't had no babies, but I can only imagine. So it was not a pleasant trip. Which automatically brings me to the point. If God's got his hand on you, and God's about to work a miracle through you, it may not be a pleasant trip. So, Jesus was born, we're talking about this, this birth. Jesus was born when Israel was under Roman rule. Now, the Jews, Israel was under Roman rule and the Jews were oppressed. This was not, this was not a comfortable invading uh, uh, army. Okay? 
The, the occupying force was not something that was letting them go about business as usual. Okay? The occupying force, the only thing I can, I can liken it to was when the Nazis went into Poland. Okay? You got to get that in your head. Okay? So life, life was, was, was struggle there. They were oppressed. And the oppressed people at that time had no, listen man, they had no designs of glory. They, didn't, they couldn't even think about glory in their head. They couldn't think about anything else. Okay? They had no power. They had no glory. They had no honor. They were just worthless people that the Romans had conquered and there was a, a, an invading army living in their place. And that's the truth, but the important thing is this. It is not the ultimate truth. It was the lowest of births that gave us the highest of truth. Okay? Because there is an invisible power happening behind what uh, Caesar Augustus and Quirinius are doing. They didn't even know, listen, they did not even know that God was using them to fulfill his plan. So that ought to tell you right there that God can use people who are not even believers to help fulfill his plan. Even today. Even today. Thank you, Deb. Even today. He can. So God, God was using them to, to fulfill something he had set in motion thousands of years before that. In uh, Micah 5, 2, it says this. Uh, Bethlehem of Apathra, you are small among the clans of Judah. One will come from you to rule over Israel. His origin is from antiquity, from the ancient times. Guys, this was 400 years before Jesus was born. And the prophecy said, in Bethlehem, in Bethlehem. So that's, how, that's why Mary and Joseph had to leave Nazareth and end up in Bethlehem. See how God works all this together? It's just, it's just like, fits like a dovetail joint. You know, Ron Martin and I were talking about his woodwork the other day, and he, he makes these amazing dovetail joints that you, I mean, man, they are just tight as a drum. That's the way God planned. He, he has this world, this, this, this dovetail thing going on. So God uses them to move them there. And so, secondly, I want you to think about this. Jesus was born where no child should ever have to be born. He was born in a feed trough. He was born in a manger and then laid in a feed trough. And if you were at my house Friday night, you went in our manger. You went in our, our working barn there where the goats had just been moved out of there. And you were able to look and you were able to see the hay that they had just been eating a few hours before you were there. And you probably stepped in some of the stuff that they had left you as a present just a few hours before they were there. Okay? But it was a working feature. It stunk in there. I didn't try to sanitize it. You know? And when you look at that feed trough there, I left the hay in there that they had been eating so you would know that's where Jesus was. He was put in a feed trough just like that. You know, the midwives didn't come and go, oh, 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 let me just get it cleaned out. Let me just get it cleaned out. No, they didn't do that. Boom, right there. Right there. The, the God of the universe was laid in an animal's feed trough in the form of a baby. <laughs> Ain't no glory in that. But you know what? Remember what Jesus said? He said, foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. You do realize Jesus was homeless most of his life. You know, he had a house he stayed at in Capernaum for a while when he was there, but he was homeless most of the time. No, listen, nothing about this scene right here says glory. Nothing. But we can learn a lot from this. One of the things I think we can learn from this, and, and just, this just kind of settled in on me four or five weeks ago when I was working on this. Listen, humility has to come before glory. Too many times we want the glory without the humility. Guys, the humility has to come before the glory. It has to. 
And that's the way the kingdom of God works. Just, I, I just pulled up some scripture here. Just, you know, in Mark, Jesus says the first is going to be last and the last is going to be first. Jesus turns this whole thing upside down. You know, if you want, if, if you want to be waited on, you've got to serve. You know, Jesus himself said, you know, I didn't come to, to you know, I, didn't, I, I came to seek and to serve people. You know? In James, in 1 Peter both, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. God said it, I didn't. But if you all up on your high horse, God ain't riding beside you. And I don't know about you, but I do not want God opposing me. I don't want God opposing what, what we feel like he's designed for Outbreak Church to do. But he says, look, if you humble yourself before the Lord in due time, God will exalt you. So just humble yourself. He says, humble yourself. And can, can it be any more humble than God himself coming and getting in a feed trough? He, he lived this out for us, folks. He modeled it right in front of us. There's no, you know, tr true greatness is not seen in visible greatness. There's a lot of people that are great in their own eyes. True greatness is in the measure of your humility. So we had the lowest birth. Let's keep going. The next part of this little story here is the, the highest glory. We move from the manger, from the stinky manger, out into the field, which some of you did the other night at the farm. You went out in the pasture and were able to look at the stars and be able to read the story there and under the stars. Great night. But here's what you need to understand. We can't really get a handle on this story until we can see it through the shepherd's eyes. So let's think about the shepherds a minute. First of all, they're out at night watching over their flocks, okay? Now, this ain't real glorious work. And they had the worst shift. I mean, they were working the night shift, okay? They had bad reputations. They stunk, you know? They stunk. I had to change my jacket before y'all came to my house Friday night because I couldn't stand myself because I smelled like a goat. <laughs> they was stinking. They was rank. The nature, of, and here's the thing, the very nature of their work meant that they were ceremonially unclean by Jewish law. That meant they couldn't even go worship. They couldn't even go to the, to the temple and worship. They could, you know, they, they were just outcasts. They were outcasts. They were considered unreliable. And did you know that shepherds were not even allowed to give testimony in court? So if you're a shepherd, you're just pretty much lowering the snake's belly. They were a despised class of people. But who did God bring the news first to? Those people. The shepherds. He didn't, he didn't put it on, you know, Fox News. He didn't put it on TMZ. Or nothing. He put it to the shepherds. To the very people who nobody else was going to pay attention to and who everybody else thought were worthless, Jesus thought they were priceless. You hear what I said? Yes. The people who, the, the, the very people who the, the world said were worthless, God in his providence said they were priceless. So he chose to announce his coming to them. And, and it's just awesome. Here they are in that dark night. All of a sudden, the way that, that dark night just runs away in the presence. And there's this angel standing there. Um, and, and they are totally afraid. I would be totally afraid, too, if I was on a hillside at night with nothing but a bunch of sheep. And all of a sudden, an angelic warrior was standing in front of me. I'd be deathly afraid. And they were. And then all of a sudden to these shepherds who were just quaking in their boots or their sandals, whatever they were wearing, 
he gives, this angel gives the highest degree of theology. And, and, and he says, look, I've got great news of great joy. And for all people, all people means everybody. What part of all is not all? That means everybody. There is nobody that the good news is not for, regardless of your social status, your color of your skin, where you live, what kind of car you drive, what school you go to, nothing. Every, everybody, the gospel is for everybody. And the good news is for everybody. And everybody can have that joy. And so the angel said, look, today, now notice that word today, in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. So a child had just been born, and he's in Bethlehem. But I want you to notice something, and this is where we're going to sort of camp out for the next two or three minutes, is what the angel said about the child. Look at what they said about the child. First of all, they said, the child is a savior. The child is a savior. He has come to save his people. Do you realize that Jesus is only called the savior twice in the gospels? One by the angels, and this is pretty cool. Two by those old rotten Samaritans who became Christ followers. And they said, we have met Jesus, the Savior. The very ones that the Jews wouldn't. You remember the Good Samaritan story? You know, all that interacting, that racial interplay there. <laughs> the despised race and the angels were the only two people to call Jesus Savior. Some of y'all have heard me mention this before, but every time I hear this and every time Christmas I think about this. When I was uh, four years old, Mom and Dad and uh, my aunts and my brother and I went up to um, Kings Mountain State Park to the lake up there. And I was swimming, and my brother was swimming. We were playing, and my brother threw this ball to me, and I missed it, and it went over in these, these uh, reeds, you know, like some, some weeds in the, in the water. So I dog paddled over there to it and got over there, got the ball, turned around, and when I turned around, I kicked to swim back, and all I can remember is the worst pain in the top of my foot ever. I mean, it was like burning fire in my foot, and I had been bit by a cottonmouth water moccasin. Still got the fang marks in the top of my foot. Here's, here's what I'm telling you. I, I just as clear as it was yesterday, that water was greenish colored, and I remember screaming, and I remember seeing that water do like this. And I remember being under the water, then I remember blacking out. But the next thing I remember is I wake up, and my head's hanging like this, and, there's, and I'm in somebody's arms. And there's this guy coming out of the water, the lifeguard. He had come down off of his platform, saw me having a struggle, came to me, picked me up in his arms, and was walking back. And I could just, just like it was yesterday, I can hear the sloshing of his feet in the water. And I, and, and I remember him walking up, and he looked at me. And t he's the most beautiful person I ever saw. Even as a four-year-old, a five-year-old. And I remember, I remember what he said to me. He looked at me. He said, it's okay. I've got you. Then I passed out again. Woke back up on the, uh, in the ambulance or, or whatever you call it uh, at that time, the ambulance. But here's the thing. That man was my savior. I was drowning. I had been bit by the serpent. My eyes were under, I had gone under, I had blacked out. And that's where I could have stayed, except somebody stepped down off of their platform and saw me struggling and came and picked me up in the water, cradled me in their arms, and then looked at me when I looked at him and he said, 
I got you. Guys, do you realize that's what the baby Jesus did for us? He saw us going under. We were down for the count. And we were going under. He was our Savior. He was our Savior. I didn't need a lifeguard that day. I needed a Savior. You don't need a good teacher. You don't need a good man. You need a Savior. You need a Savior. Next thing. It says the child is the Christ. Christ, this is the only place in the New Testament where Christ the Lord is used. Okay, Christ in Greek means the anointed one. Uh, the Messiah is where we get that from the Hebrew term. Anointed means you're set apart for special service. Remember in the Old Testament, uh, Moses anointed Aaron and his sons to be the priests of Israel. Then Samuel anointed uh, Saul and David as kings of Israel. And then that title was also applied to the future one whom God was raised up. And so, so the Jews knew what the word Messiah was. The Christ, they knew what that was. They'd been looking for the Christ for thousands of years. So he's a Savior. He's Christ. And then the third thing is this. It says he's the Lord. He's the Lord. That Lord refers to two things. That, that Lord refers to his deity and the incarnation of God in the flesh. Remember, he's 100% God, 100% man. But it also refers to his legal claim on your heart. And you, you realize this is the only one of those three things that there's an option to? He's your Savior. He's your Christ. But you have to make him your Lord. He's the Lord. But you have to make him your Lord. You have to make him your Lord. He's going to save his people from their sins. He's the promised one of Israel. He is God. He's the maker. He's the ruler. So the greatest event in history had just taken place. The Messiah had been born. The Jews had been waiting for this for years and years and years and years. And the announcement comes to a bunch of humble shepherds. And the great news about this is that he comes to all people, all types of people, including the plain, the ordinary, the outcast of society. And he comes to anyone who humbles their heart to make him Lord. That means you submit to his lordship. Whoever you are, wherever you are in life right now, guys, you can do this. You simply say, Jesus, you, I want to make you my Lord. I want to accept you as my Lord. You are my Savior. You are the Christ. You are the Son of God. You are the Lord, and now I'm making you my Lord. My Lord. So when the angel finished, I love this. The angel finished telling those, those uh, shepherds what they want to hear, and all of a sudden the, the angelic choir comes in for the, for the closing number. And they everywhere. I mean, it's everywhere. And I can only imagine what that must have been like. And it said they were praising God. They were praising God. They were praising God. And of course, you know the rest of the story. The shepherds go, they find. And you do realize, too, that the shepherds had to give them a sign because all these people coming to Bethlehem would have meant there was a bunch of children born in Bethlehem. At some, you know, so they had to know which one. So they found the sign in, in the, the feed trough, the baby in the feed trough. And so the angels went and they started teaching people everything they had seen. They, and Mary was just med meditating on all this and just, just soaking all this in. And and the angels and the shepherds both returned God, uh, returned back to their places. And they were doing nothing but giving glory to God. Guys, what else would you do when you see God face to face but give Him glory? What else would you do? There's no, there's no other response. No other response. You know, there's a real big difference between thanking God... And praising God. Both are very important. But there's a big difference. We thank God 
because of who he is. I'm sorry, we, we thank God, I, I messed that up. We thank God because of what he has done and, and how he has blessed us. Okay, we praise God for who he is. I'm going to say that again. We praise God for who he is. Remember that old song, I praise you, uh, not for all the mighty, I praise you because of who you are, not for all the mighty works that you've done. You know, too many times I think, and God loves our thanks, but too many times we spend all this time thanking God and never praising Him. I'm going to do something totally random right now. We should do this sometimes in student ministry. It's called popcorn praise. Now remember, I'm not asking you to thank God for something He's given you. I'm asking you to praise God for who He is. So right now, I'm just going to open the floor. Just in one sentence, I want you to thank, I want you to praise God. Somebody, somebody just kick it off. God is my promise keeper. Praise Him, He's your promise keeper. He's my Savior and He's my healer. That's right. He's your healer and He's your, your Savior. What else? Redeemer. Redeemer. My hope. Your hope. Light and All of that, yeah. <laughs> the ultimate Father. The ultimate Father, yes, yeah, Sam. Peace. Peace. King of kings, Lord of lords, strength. He's our banner. He's our righteousness. He's our healer. He's our defender. He's our strong tower. He is our ever-present help in times of trouble. No army formed against it. it guys, it ain't going to happen. Stop living your life like, a, like you're running. Turn around and face and just say, hey, whoa. I'm a child. I'm a child. Of the living king. I am more than a conqueror. And I ain't running no more, Satan. What I'm doing is I'm running you back to the house, Satan. What would you say, Di? The final sacrifice. The final sacrifice. And see what we're doing? We're praising God for that. Can you imagine all those angels? And they knew God personally. <laughs> I mean, they'd seen him in the kitchen. Can you imagine how they were praising him? You know? Man. Guys, this is what we need to do. We just, and I'm, I'm not saying I'm any better than you, but, but I just, I find myself sometimes when I, I leave, I go out to feed the goats and the dog in the morning, and, and the sun is coming up right through our log barn, and it's the most beautiful orange sunrise. And I'll just stand out there and I'll laugh, and I'll go, God, I just praise you because all your creation is just singing your praise. You know? You just, you just get in that mindset of, of praising God. Praise, and we thank Him for what He's done, but we praise Him for who He is. We praise Him for who He is. He's our Heavenly Father. He, he's our heavenly Father. Right, Beck? He is. He is. And I know that's weird for some folks because I know some of us have earthly fathers that, that when we talk about a heavenly Father, you can't compare those and don't even try. I know some of you, your earthly fathers have done stuff to you that is so horrible. All I can say is I am so sorry. But what was done to you does not define who you are. Your heavenly father would never do anything like that. Your heavenly father never would. Now, you just praised God. Another way of praising God, and I'm going to ask you to do this in a minute. Now, y'all think, boy, Scott ate too many sausage balls over, <laughs> over the weekend. Uh, Heather, great job. Yeah. <laughs> Heather knocked the sausage balls out of the park. <clears throat> this basket right here. We're not going to have guys come around and take up the offering. Okay? As an act of your praise... And your worship of God. Because you do realize that giving is worship. All of life is worship. We say it a lot of times. Don't, try to, don't come in here for an hour and think you're going to worship in here if you ain't worshiping out there. Or you're just being fake in here. And we don't need no fake folks. No. I'm tired of fakeness. Yep, yep. You know? What we're going to ask you in a minute, we're going to just sing some songs. We're going to just let the Holy Spirit settle down in this place. And we're just going to sing some songs. You don't have to stand. You don't have to do anything. You can sit. But I do want you thinking about these words. I want you just, just getting this all over you. And it's not to manipulate any. Y'all know me better than that. I hate manipulation. I'm not going to manipulate you. 
we're giving the Holy Spirit a chance to work. So sometime, sometime during any of the songs, you feel free to just get up, come up here, and as an act of worship, and I want you to consider it as that. You're not just walking up here and putting an envelope in here. You are saying, God, I worship you and I praise you with everything I own, and you drop it in here. Okay? So the team's going to come on up. Whatever God's telling you to do, guys, let me read you this quote. And, and I think, well, two quotes, actually. Have we got, yeah, this is by Ralph Sockman. The hinge of history is on the door of the Bethlehem stable. And then let me read you this one. Some of you may have seen this one. If you don't know who Dietrich Bonhoeffer is, he was a, a priest who was murdered by the, uh, in the concentration camps, in the Nazi concentration camps, for sharing Jesus in the concentration camp. Listen to what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said about Christmas. And this so wraps up everything we just talked about. Bonhoeffer says, Who will celebrate Christmas correctly? Whoever finally lays down all power, all honor, all reputation, all vanity, all arrogance, all individualism beside the manger. Guys, Jesus is your Messiah. He's your Savior. And He wants to be your Lord. During this first song, I'm going to be down here at the front. It's a great song. We've used it every time for the, for the holidays. If you need to talk, if, if, you, if you say, today I'm ready to make Jesus my Lord, then come and let's talk about it. Let's just talk about it. And I'm going to ask maybe some of the elders, if you don't mind, just to go ahead and stand up. Prayer team, some folks just stand up around the side. If you need to talk to anybody or pray with anybody, there's going to be people to do that around. Okay. Today is the day you can unwrap the most amazing present ever given. And you can turn it right around for His glory. God, we worship You and we praise You, Lord. God, forgive us when we leave You in the manger and don't take You out of the manger. Some of us still have this picture of baby Jesus in the manger and never see Him have a, we never have a picture of him as our Lord. So Jesus today, Holy Spirit, we invite you to flood this place, fill this atmosphere, overwhelm us, let everything we do for the next few minutes be totally out of the overflow of the Holy Spirit in us, praising you and bringing glory to your name because of who you are. In Jesus' name I pray, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to your glory, God.